Good morning, everyone. My name is Caroline Valentine, and I am so happy to be here with you all for this very special day in the life of Plymouth Church. Reverend Dr. Jared Wartman, our candidate for Plymouth's next senior pastor, is here today to lead us in worship. And then also today at 1 p.m. here in the sanctuary or online via Zoom, we will gather for a special congregational meeting to vote on calling Jared to Plymouth. Jared joins us today from Atlanta, Georgia, where he currently lives with his wife, Katrina, and their three children, Clara, Benjamin, and Charlie. You can read a little bit more about the Wartman family in the insert in your bulletin. When you meet Jared, you may notice that he does not bring with him a southern accent. He's actually from Missouri and has spent considerable time in the Midwest before moving out east for both school and work. Jared is currently at Peachtree Christian Church, a Disciples of Christ congregation in Atlanta. I've had the privilege of getting to know Jared over the course of the last several months, and I'm so excited for you all to meet him today. Jared, thank you for being here with us, and welcome to Plymouth. Well, thank you for that, and thank you, Caroline, for that kind introduction. It has been a gift to be the recipient of your hospitality and your kindness. Even behind masks, I can tell that you're all nice. So thank you. It is so good to be with all of you today. Let us now join our hearts and minds and voices in prayer. Let us pray. Loving God, open our hearts to hear what your Spirit is saying. Meet us here and make us new. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Our scripture lesson comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, verses 35 through 45. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What is it you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink, or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They replied, We are able. Then Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink, you will drink, and with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, You know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many." Here ends the reading of Mark's Gospel. you please join with me again in prayer? Gracious God, quiet our minds and our hearts so that we might truly hear something of your goodness today. Supply us with courage and wisdom for interpretation and application. May these words and the meditations of all our hearts bring us closer to you and to our neighbors. Remind us now of who you are longing for us to become. In Christ we pray. Amen. Can you give an honest answer? Genuinely, candidly, sincerely. Deep down, can you tell the truth? Here's the question. 
What do you want? I mean, what do you really, really want? Right now, in this very moment, what do you want more than anything else in the entire world? If you could snap your fingers, blink your eyes, and have your wish granted, what would you want to happen, have, change, achieve, experience, or become? Oh, you don't have to blurt it out. You don't have to write it down in a tiny script in the corner of your bulletin with your hand covering your answer. You don't have to whisper your deepest desire to your neighbor. But I wonder, can you confront yourself and your thoughts? Can you audaciously admit in your head and in your heart in complete and utter silence what you really really want. Maybe you'd want a way out, or maybe a way in. Maybe you'd want more of something, or maybe you'd want less. Here is a general truth. So often, what you want is a revealing reflection of what you love. And so much of the time, what you want and what you love are the same, or in the words of philosopher James K.A. Smith, you are what you love because you live toward what you want. Our wants steer our steps, animate our imaginations, and guide our conversations. Such is the case in our lesson from Mark's Gospel. Notice how our passage begins. Teacher, We want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. These are the words James and John put to Jesus. I wonder, what do you think Jesus' face must have looked like? James and John are boldly asking Jesus for a blank check. They want Jesus to grant them a favor before they make their request. Jesus replies, what is it you want me to do for you? In short, what do you want? If you were making the film, would you have James and John look Jesus in the eyes? Would they be brash and bold, cool and cavalier? Or would their gaze drop and their shoulders slump as their words tumbled out? Would they be cagey or calm as they corner Christ? Either way, this is what they say. Uh, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. I think we're meant to gasp a little. I mean, surely that shouldn't be said, shouldn't be asked, uh, at least not out loud, and especially not in the earshot of others. Shouldn't their longing for power and prestige stay secretly scribbled in the corner of the page with their hands covering up their desires? Surely, this isn't what someone following Jesus should want, or at least they should have the sense not to speak up, right? But they do speak up. They vocalize what they want, and what they want is a place of honor. They want to stay in the seat of glory. The Greek word that's used for glory in this passage has a linguistic range that includes words like honor, Fame, greatness, praise, and pride. James and John are asking for honorable positions, for the best seats, for the pride of place. Now, you would think that the other disciples would be pulling out their smartphones at this moment. They'd be texting that face-to-palm emoji as if to communicate, Can you believe the brashness of James and John? I mean, how harebrained can they be? But that's not what the rest of the disciples do. The other disciples seemingly get incensed and irritated, not because James and John crossed the line, but because they didn't think to ask Jesus first for themselves and for their glory. I recently heard it said that there's nothing worse than feeling as if you've been dismissed. 
Maybe you know what that's like. Like someone else got something you wanted, but didn't get and won't get. When this happens, people often respond in one of two ways. Sometimes you sink into yourself. Other times, being left out or overlooked might embolden you to say, that's not fair, or what about me, and what about what could have been mine? Reading between the lines, it's as if the other disciples are immediately indignant at the thought of being left out, of being stuck, squinting at Jesus from the cheap seats. Have you ever gone out to eat with a group of people only to find yourself by chance in that strange seating scoot and shuffle to be sitting in the worst possible seat at the table? The whole meal you're leaning in with your hand bending your ear, trying to hear bits of a conversation that you wish that you could be a part of. So much so that you think to yourself on loop, if only I had a better seat, this would all be different. If only I were closer, if only I were sitting there, everything would be better right now. After all, you're just as interesting and entertaining as they are. And there we have it. Jesus knows that we can get caught up with chasing the glory, the better seats, and the places of privilege. But here's the thing. Here's the teachable moment that Jesus must stop and articulate to all of the disciples, not just to James and John. It goes something like this. You must be careful not to use what religion gives you for the wrong purposes. You must be so careful not to fall into the trap of thinking that following God is first and foremost about what you get out of it, about the reward and the spotlight and the privilege. You must be careful not to manipulate the goodness of God for your aggrandizement. Because if you do, you can subtly slip into places of oppression. You just might end up falling in line with those who lord it over others. As Jesus says, you can become a tyrant. At least in hindsight, Jesus, here in Mark's Gospel, is teaching us that the church shouldn't ever be the location where oppression begins, grows, or spreads. Oppressing or excluding others is never God's way, period. I love the words of commentator Ched Myers, who puts it like this, quote, Leadership belongs only to those who learn and follow the way of nonviolence, who are prepared not to dominate, but to serve and suffer at Jesus' side, end quote. Yes, Jesus pulls the disciples to the side for a heart-to-heart to to talk about the desires of their hearts, to talk about the the seemingly upside-down logic of leadership in the kingdom of God. You see, I think it's true that we live toward what we love and what we want. Jesus hears it in the request of James and John. And Jesus sees it in the other faces that resented their not calling dibs first on the glory of God for themselves. It's at this point when reading the Gospels that we should proceed with extra caution. If we're not careful, our interpretive conclusion can go something like this. How foolish the disciples are. It can be tempting to to fold our arms and shake our heads and wag a tired finger, saying, When will they learn? They should know better by now. How can they be so daft? How can they be so smug? But here's the thing, and the thing is the point of the sermon. We can be so busy maligning their misdeeds mocking their mistakes and musing about their misgivings that we miss the mark of the story. Mark is relaying a story for our benefit. He's asking about our hearts and about our wants. Mark is equipping us to ask and answer questions like, what happens when we crave a religion that focuses more on what we get 
than what we can give. Or what happens when we're tempted to see church and community leadership as a matter of privilege and status? Or what happens when we stop thinking about the justice and equality that God wants for the world and instead start thinking about what we want for ourselves? Or what happens when our desire to be on the inside is the very impulse or action that places others on the outside? Or what happens when we want to decide who's included and who isn't? You see, if we're not careful, we can get it all terribly wrong. We can want the wrong things. The agonies of ambition can curate ill will, harm, and exclusion. Our desires, wants, and loves can get the best of us and can result in the worst for others. Loving the wrong things can be distorting, distracting, and devastating. But let's be honest. Rarely is it ever so simple. Sometimes our wants, longings, and loves braid together both the selfish and the selfless. We can convince ourselves that our mostly noble motivations outweigh what's slightly suspect in our hearts. For the disciples, and probably for us too, the looming danger is that we'll make an allowance for our wants and loves to be ever so slightly off the course we know we should be setting and following. In James K.A. Smith's book, You Are What You Love, he tells the story of the tragic 1914 accident between the steamship Monroe and the Nantucket, a merchant vessel. Smith notes that 41 sailors lost their lives in the frigid waters of the Atlantic. After an extensive investigation, it was finally determined that the captain of the Monroe was using a compass that deviated approximately two degrees from the standard magnetic compass. This deviation charted the Monroe on a fatal collision course. The analogy is clear. Sometimes we're headed in the right general direction. But sometimes all it takes is the slightest variation for havoc to ensue. When it comes down to it, Mark's question to us is straightforward. When it comes to your life, and when it comes to our common discipleship and future together, what do you want? Do you want to be a community of hospitality, a place where everyone belongs and has a seat at the table? Do you want to be a church where justice and peace are unwavering, a place where kindness and love drive our actions and our reactions? Do you want to be a people who lead from compassion, caring about the good of others before considering ourselves? What do you want? What do we want? They're questions that deserve honest answers.